Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a pleasure to be here today to sort of uh, introduce uh, Mighty Governance in this esteemed establishment. It's an honor to continue to talk about IT governance as a very important frame under the window and umbrella of corporate governance. And I think um, I started this around, uh, I think, 2012 or so when the society start, launched the journal and wrote an article in the journal about um, IT governance then. But I'll start today with a story. And I think my story starts with looking at the realm of IT certifications that we have out there. I remember about before I joined the business school, I wanted to, I was getting a bit antsy in terms of knowledge. And I said to a colleague of mine, oh, I'm going to get a certification. And he's like, which one? And I said, oh, maybe a Microsoft one. And he said, but why bother? You understand the concepts. You don't need some letters after your name to say you understand the concepts. So based on that, I realized that sometimes having the technical competency and technical skills is not enough within an organization. We need to think about the practice competencies that we bring into our organizations and how they are helping develop the management and practice of IT in general. With teaching at the Lagos Business School, our focus is on IT management practices. And we do that across all managerial roles, irrespective of your functional responsibility. And so I've been told a lot of times that, oh, why do I need to learn about technology? But as we can see today, we all need to learn about technology because whether we like it or not, technology is not a choice anymore. It's a tool that we need to use to work, to enable, to communicate. And we're doing different things with technology as we go ahead. And it's only going to get more interesting. So let's come back to the topic at hand, IT governance. Why do we talk about IT governance? Why has IT governance become quite important and pertinent in the frame of corporate governance in general? And I think I'll take you back to the um, days of 2012. And that was in corporate America when we had some very popular scandals, accounting scandals relating to the people and um, companies like Enron, WorldCom and Tyco. And those resulted in um, the creation and the enactment of an act called Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is a, or SOX. And this was really about looking at the accuracy and reliability of in financial information. And in those days, because we, we were under the guise that, oh, technology is processing our financial inc um, information, and so we need to still control it. So companies were not devoid of the responsibility of saying that, oh, whether you're processing it on technology or you're processing it manually, the accuracy and reliability of that information must be sound and signed off and the responsibility of directors and executive management. But then again, fast forward to today. Today, we're talking about concepts like, or, th or things like data is the new oil. So today we see that information and the related assets are really new assets within the organization that need to be managed diligently. Today's thief is not coming in through the front door, but it's coming in through the cable. And this is where we see today, we've had, we've had information, we've seen cases of information theft with consumer data and private records being stolen. We've seen cases of um, systems hijack with ransomware. We've seen cases of corporate data being stolen through espionage and also national security data and information being stolen. So the call is that as directors and executives responsible for the oversight of companies, whether public, publicly held or privately held companies, our duties and our responsibilities extend to the governance of information and the related technology assets. And that's what we call IT governance. But before I go into IT governance, let's look at the second factor of why we should bother. The second is um, one of the areas, and this is the technology or information systems area, and it's about the payoff of technology. In other words, does IT give any business benefits, right? And these are because when we buy technology or we launch technology projects in our organizations, these are launched under the auspices or guises of, oh, we want to gain competitive advantage, we want to improve our productivity, or we want to enhance our operational efficiency. But then, does IT really deliver those projected benefits? How do we know? What mechanisms do we have in place to say with certainty that, oh, IT delivered 
the benefits. And let me just give you an example of how to think about this. Imagine I was about to make a $1 million investment in a bottled water manufacturing plant. I will know how many bottles are produced, how many bottles are sent to the market, and I can see the financial flows coming back in terms of from the sale of those bottles of water. But if I took the same $1 million and invested in an IT project, what can I guarantee is going to be the return? We don't, we don't know, okay? That's another problem. The third problem is whether we like it or not, and these are things that um, Walter and Shea are going to delve more into. IT is beginning to introduce new business threats. And these are business threats resulting from the increase of cyber theft or cyber crime and cyber fraud or data theft and data crime in general. And I'm calling them business threats because they're not technology threats. They're business threats because they, they hamper the entire business, not just the technology operations of the business. So based on these three reasons, the fact that accounting responsibilities and accuracy of information, the need for an IT payoff, as well as the business threats emanating from the use of IT, we need to begin to pay attention to IT governance and realize that it is everyone's business, not just the producers of technology. So what then do we say is IT governance? And I'll use the definition from the Information Systems Control and Audit Authority or Association or whatever, the ISACA or whatever they call themselves in general. And what they determine IT governance or define IT governance as, it's a process, first of all, to monitor and control key IT capability decisions in an attempt to ensure the delivery of value to key stakeholders in the organization. And so basically from that definition, the first thing I want to extract from that is who are the process owners? Because we know it's a process, right? Who are the process owners? There's collective responsibility amongst the board members and the executives in general. What are the processes that we need to be mindful of? And then also the third area is what are the decision areas, the decision rights that we need to take control of and be mindful of? So I'll start with the processes and the, control and the domain areas of IT governance. And there are five of them in general. The first is strategic alignment. And the whole strategic alignment is IT is not an end in itself for any business. IT is there to complement and supplement the activities of the business to ensure the business meets its goals. So the first question we need to ask and think about when we're talking about strategic alignment is, are the technologies that we're buying or deploying, how are they going to help us enhance or deploy or meet our business objectives in general? And likewise, how are our business objectives going to be achieved using these technologies? It seems like a very um, simple thing to do, but it's one of the most difficult because this is where we need to ensure that we get the most bang for the buck. We need to ensure that we're buying the right technologies that would help us meet our business goals and objectives because like other than technology companies, no business that is using technology has an IT problem. You have a business problem that could require a technology solution. So with strategic alignment, the board has responsibilities to ensure that we have a strategic planning process in place. And that strategic planning document or process is a three to eight year document that itemizes how will we deploy and use IT and also how will that IT help us meet our business goals and objectives. The second area that's critical is the area of value delivery. And value delivery ensures that we have the right processes in place to ensure that, and the right organizational structures in place to ensure that we derive value. Now value is dependent on what the organizational goals are. Value to one organization might be something different in another organization, but it's really about ensuring that we have the right complements and structures to bring back some form of value. And we'll talk about the performance measurement of that value later on, because then those are now related to the indicators that we associate that we want value from. The next thing is resource management. Now, one of the biggest, um, I think it's a myth, I'll call it a myth about technology is that if I build it, they will come, or if I build it, they will use it. 
But then again, usage it depends on expertise and competency and skill. How do we ensure that we ensure, how do we ensure that we have the right competencies and capabilities to use the technology effectively? If you don't press anything on your computer, well, maybe with the likes of Siri today, but if you don't give your computer an instruction, either through the keyboard or through your voice or something or the other, your computer is not going to do anything. So how do you ensure that we have the right resources and competencies and capabilities to be able to use the technology to drive that value? Because sometimes we buy the best of best, right? But then again, we, we now say, oh, well, we didn't buy it because it's not easy to use. It's not this, it's not that. Then how do we ensure that we even have the right capabilities and complement of skills and capabilities to ensure we can do the job? Don't forget IT is about management practices, infusing the use of technology into our day-to-day -day management practices. There's the management of technology, which is a technical side, but there's also the business side that you need to think about. So resource management is critical. Do we even have the right complement of IT at the, at the decision at the board level and even also at the management level? So when we're talking about strategic alignment, for example, one of the things I ask is, oh, who, sit, who from IT? Do you have an I, a CIO or somebody that represents IT in executive management or exco conversations? And some organizations say, no, IT reports to the finance and admin, IT reports to somebody else. And I'm like, okay, so how can you be guided when you're making business decisions in the exco and thinking about using technology when you don't have the technology voice present at the table. And little things like that in terms of even the structure of the organization can also be telltale signs of misalignment. The next thing, like I said, IT is not, um, it's not the holy grail in any, in any shape, form or size possible. And I won't deceive you that, oh, once you buy technology, you're risk-free, you're free from any kind of threats. IT has its own counteracting threats that it brings with it. And one of the biggest fears of every CEO, or every business leader today is cybersecurity. Because you can see even from global leaders about how threats are daily and, threat, and people are being penetrated depending on what type of information is being sought. So we're not exempt from these kinds of threats. But then again, that doesn't also mean that we cannot, we should not do anything but it's about how do we take precautions and how do we build again the capacity that we need to build to ensure that we're continually protecting ourselves every day. So risk management is something that we need to be, uh, we need to be clued into. So rather than just in some cases where you could talk about operational risk, the risk category of technology risk is also pertinent. What types of risks are we um, are, 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 being, are, we, are, we see, are we having now with technology? What type of risks are we having with people working from home? And those are things that we need to start putting into the fray and having practices and measurements and monitoring them effectively and proactively. Finally, you know, what, what does IT contribute to the bottom line? How do we measure it? Because, you know, as the analogy says, what you cannot measure, you cannot manage. So we know that IT gives us performance benefits or makes us a bit more productive or, or, or gives us competitive advantage. But then again, how do we know? What measures do we have in place to ensure that we can truly certify and are certain that IT does these things? Because don't forget that as board members and as executive managers, you have the, 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 the um, decision rights. You make the decisions, but how do you come back and close the loop? and say, oh, we made this investment of like, let's take my water plant. We made this investment of a million dollars and in six months we've made XXX amounts of money back, right? What's the return on investment from that technology acquisition or technology project? And we also need to be mindful that IT returns happen over a longer period of time. IT returns can happen depending on how, how effective the project goes in terms of putting it in, acquiring it, putting it in place, getting people to use it and getting, building proficiency and expertise over time. But when we talk about IT performance management also, we are minded by a framework called the IT Balance Scorecard, 
And the IT balance scorecard really helps us think about, rather than just thinking about operational benefits, which we, we can measure sometimes, but we also have to say, okay, do we all have, can we get financial benefits from every IT acquisition? Also, can we also look at the customer experience benefits that we get from IT, ex, um, ex, um, from IT applications? And then finally also the learning and growth and development of our people in general. So that balanced approach also gives us a mindset that, okay, even if IT can't report on quantitative financial um, numbers, can we also build on qualitative business improvement, um, business improvement factors that would also help move the business forward? So those are the five domain areas that we need to be mindful of. Strategic alignment, resource management, performance measurement, risk management, as well as value delivery. Now, in terms of decisions, don't forget that that's, another, that's one of the things the process of IT governance also mandates us to think about, making decisions about technology within the organization. And I know that a lot of us will say, oh, why should I, why, what informs me or what knowledge do I have to make IT decisions? And so that's why a lot of the time, our decision-making abilities have been delegated to IT professionals. But don't forget that IT professionals have a different worldview from business professionals. So part of governance is having sufficient enough understanding of what the business of technology, not the technology itself, and being able to make the decisions required regarding the business of technology. And what are those decisions that we need to talk about? The first is the principles that are guiding IT deployments in the organization, because we need to have a philosophy, a why. That why is sort of the boundary with which we set. And that can be set in a qualitative statement of we will use IT in XYZ manner, or we will be known for this in IT, etc. The next thing we need to think about is the architecture. And there, there are many frameworks for defining a lot of things when you have the right resources in place. And when we talk about architecture, it's really about the structure and the design, the policies and the relationships and technical choices with the design of the IT layout. Now, in this COVID era, one of the things we didn't anticipate was the fact that we will be working as distributed offices. And those distributed locations will be homes, not even formal business environments. So what we had done with our architecture was we had built a lot of capacity in our office offices not all the homes. Now we're having to sort of backward engineer into ensuring that there's sufficient capacity in the homes of our employees to be able to do the work. So that's the architecture. The next thing is the infrastructure. What, what types of infrastructure do we buy? What types of infrastructure do we choose and design? The next thing is the issue of business applications and needs. And these are related to software selection decisions, project management decisions. Are we going to build internally? Are we going to outsource? Are we going to onshore? Are we going to offshore? Are we going to use cloud computing solutions and decisions? Now, I'm not trying to scare you with the technical terms, but I think that whether we like it or not, we need to understand the, the, the high level definitions to be able to even make informed decisions. And what I always express to business people is you need to challenge the IT people. It's not about the technical know-how. It's about how that technology would fit into the business to ensure that we can meet our business goals and objectives. Finally, it's about the investment and prioritization. You know, don't forget that with technology, one of the things that um, frustrates a lot of business people is it doesn't, it seems to be a bottomless pit, right? You buy one today and they come back and tell you tomorrow that, oh, well, we need this, we need that, we need that. And sometimes that's also a process of bad resource management. Because when you have the right resource management practices in place, what you should be looking at is, what is my total cost of ownership based on what I want to do? And the bottom line is sometimes we have to make a lot of trade-offs around some of the IT decisions that we need to make because we want, we want to be able to ensure that we don't just buy, but we can actually use the technology and convert the investment, um, investment into value to ensure that we drive our business forward in, in globally. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop there and then we'll take some questions and answers.
and I, I hope I would I, I promise um, the society that we would write another paper on IT governance that bringing into the fore the recent trends, especially since um, a lot of um, regulatory authorities have also updated their codes of corporate governance. We have the new financial reporting council guidelines, etc. So we would work, we'll do some work in that area. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ma. I have a question here from Mr. Redola. How do we relate the constant change of IT when we are designing IT strategy for three to eight years? Okay. Thank you very much for that, Michael. And I think that the, the, the problem with IT is that, yes, IT changes and it will continue to change. But what I try and tell people is focus on what you want to do. The technology is a black box, right? And even when you buy a, tech, a piece of technology today, you're not, what, you're, what you're specifying in your strategy is what you want to achieve, not the procurement stage, right? The procurement stage is about what are we buying to achieve what we want to achieve, okay? So I look at strategy in three stages. I look at the business strategy in terms of giving us a direction of where we want to be going. The middle way is the, what we call the IS strategy that defines how do we want to get there. And that how is not about technology because that how might be related to what resources do we need, what processes and policies do we need, what culture do we need in our organization other than just the technology. Then at the bottom is the IT part, which really relates to the procurement. And the procurement is now, when, you're, when you've decided, let's say, for example, you decided you want to do X, Y, Z two years ago. By the time you want to procure, you're looking at who is going to be the best person to give me the best value for my money at that point in time. Okay, so don't always, and I think one of the things we also, I always, I always sort of de-emphasize is this need to continually upgrade. Upgrades are good, but don't forget that when you have to deploy an upgrade across an enterprise, it can also be disruptive. So again, it's also about planning the change and planning the disruption. Otherwise, you find out that your business is going through very cyclical, um, cyclical cycles rather than just having some form of momentum and continuous improvement. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, you talked about um, measuring the impact of um, IT infrastructures and governance in, quality, in qualitative measures and that they might not actually be. So I was going to ask, in Wayne, and you also talked about the challenges that come with um, implementing IT governance or IT infrastructures. So is there any model that you can use, especially as an IT professional, to demonstrate to your board, for example, on the benefits or, or how the benefits of having good IT governance structures far outweigh the challenges. Is there any model that you can use, especially to demonstrate quantitative benefits? Because I know that when it comes to organizations, we're looking at the bottom line. So is there any way to demonstrate in terms of financial benefits so that your directors or your board can better understand how important this is and how valuable it is to have effective IT governance structures? Okay, very simple, yes. And I, and I, I wouldn't, what I would say is that the financial measures are there, but don't forget that those financial measures could also be in terms of cost savings. So I'll give you a simple example. CUG lines, right? A lot of organizations have acquired CUG lines, and the benefit of that is that we're supposed to be reducing the unit cost of communication internally, okay? Now, what I can use to measure that is but you have a benchmark, right? And this is all about continuous management and control. So we have a benchmark and says that, oh, we were spending, let's say 500,000 or a month before on um, telecoms, right? Now we want to bring, we've implemented the CUG line, let's say it cost us 5 million. And so basically we want to be able to say that in the next 10 months, we should be able to write off that investment. And we should be able to sort of write off the investment and we can now begin to say that, oh, we're now having the cost savings of that, in, of that infrastructure. Now, somebody needs to measure, right? Because with what you cannot measure, you cannot manage. So for example, where do you get the data from in the first place? And this is where your balance scorecard, when you're defining your, um, your measures helps. 
where's the source of that data in organizations? Because it's all well and good for me to say, oh, you need to measure this, you need to measure that. But you need to also go back within your internal organization and say, does that piece of information exist? If it doesn't exist, where do I get it from? And a lot of the time, by the time you go through that whole process, you realize that you, and you have to be realistic and pragmatic at the time, because if you don't have the information, then you say, okay, what do I have that can stand as a proxy? Okay. But it's now going into every single, it's a detailed process. It's not something that you just do cursory. Another one is email, right? And I, I'll give you an example with email. Once we started having email, the bank started use, using that to distribute bank statements, right? What costs reduce in, the, in, their, in their books? Their cost of dispatch riders re, um, went down. The cost of buying new motorbikes went down. The cost of hiring people for the dispatch went down. The cost of buying, maintaining those, uh, um, those dispatch riders and the, and the motorcycles went down. The cost of printing went down. The cost of printers went down. So those, okay. that's just one use case. <laughs> So every single implementation can have its own use case. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ma. Because of time, we won't be able to take, you have another question, but um, it's about data. And since we have the data protection person coming on now, I'm going to reserve that question for him. So please, our audience, if you have any questions, just send them through the question and answer session. We're going to take the next um, session now, which is data protection and privacy. Mr. Adeyemi Adeshe, we're ready for you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Aditayo. Um, so um, I will just start by from what um, Professor West said. It's about IT, it's about technology. Now, what data protection has done is pre-GDPR, pre especially from the European perspective, organizations, they tend to use data as much as they want, anyhow they want. Now, GDPR came live and said, we're giving the power back to the citizens or the people that owns the data. So we're now passing the responsibility and the liabilities upon companies that process personal data. And what it did was it now brought out certain things or certain principles that organizations need to do to ensure that they process personal data in a respective, in a res, res, respectable manner. So that is why GDPR came live. However, what um, Nigeria now did was because of the uh, globalization of businesses, they now went and brought in their own data protection regulation, which is the Nigerian data protection regulation. So what I'm going to be talking about today, let me just share my screen one second. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, the introduction to the privacy and data protection and what it would mean for your business, data breach and security incident, what businesses need to do to be compliant and the best practices in terms of standards and frameworks that I would recommend businesses to ob obtain. So the first thing is definition. Let's start with what is the NDPR, the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation and the General Data Protection Regulation. The General Data Protection Regulation is the regulation that requires businesses and organizations to protect the personal data of EU residents and also to safeguard the right of EU residents. Whilst the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation is a regulation that requires businesses to safeguard the rights of Nigerian citizens, both in Nigeria and abroad, to prevent the manipulation of personal data. And the next question is, does, does any of this regulation apply to you? So this is what you need to answer. If your company, if your company is located in Nigeria or is located abroad and you process personal data of Nigerian residents or Nigerian residents in Nigeria or Nigerian residents abroad, or if your company have employees in Nigeria, then the NDPR applies to you. The GDPR would apply only to you if your organization is, if a part of your organization or um, a subsidiary or headquarters is located in the European Union, or you're looking at outside of Europe, based in Nigeria, for example, but you're targeting European residents, then GDPR will be applicable to you as well. Why should it matter to you? Um, the first thing is, if you don't comply with either the GDPR and the NDPR, your company is liable to be fined, which is a regulation, regulatory fine. Under the GDPR, organizations will fail to implement um, 
or suffer a data breach because of their lack of implementation of the GDPR, they could be fined of up to 20 million euros or 4% of the company's annual turnover in the last year of whichever is greater. Under the NDPR, there's a similar require, there's a similar fine as well, which is organizations who fail to implement the NDPR within their, um, within their company or suffer a data breach because of their failure to implement that. They could face up to 10 million naira, up to 2% of the annual gross revenue in the last year, whichever is greater. But that's not just the reason why it should matter to you. Apart from that, the, the respective regulation has given data subject, which is the data owners, which is your stakeholders, that you process the personal data to take you to court for civil liabilities, for lack of um, giving them, for not giving them their rights as required by the law. And also, your stakeholders' confidence in you, in your business. What we've, re what we've come to realize is when we are looking at the return on investment, when we're using it to measure, we've come to realize that Stakeholders, when you implement um, any data privacy laws, wider in Nigeria, in um, Europe, or wherever you're based, it, and you implement and you show your um, stakeholders that you've done it, the, the, the trust that they have in the organization goes higher. And what we've realized is the impact that it would have with your organization is huge in terms of monetary terms. But if you don't, most times it erodes um, the trust of stakeholders in your organization and frankly some of them they, you, you might lose some of the data that brings in money for you now what the ndpr and the gdpr what data privacy what it entails really is just for organization it's just the process it, it, it brought up something called data privacy by default and design which means that it is the process to identify every processes within your organization, every IT structures, everything that you're doing that involves processing personal data is, is teaching organizations to identify, analyze, evaluate, consult, communicate, and plan the treatment of potential privacy impact regarding the processing of personal information within that business. And the goal is just to avoid a data breach. This data privacy by default and design is normally framed within a general risk management framework of your organization, which is mandatory for data controller under the law to, for, to early identify required control measures, especially when it comes to the IT uh, infrastructures or buying of a new tool. Now, what it would mean for your business. Now, I've been talking about personal data. I've been talking about um, information. I will start with the definition of what personal data is. Personal data is actually a little bit different from personal identifiable information. That is where some people get it wrong. Because personal inform identifiable information is just something, it, it's personal data that people can easily be identified. But what NDPR and GDPR have said is it's bigger than that. We're talking about personal data, which is any information relating to an identified or identifiable living person. And examples of personal data is HR records. Examples include CCTV images, photographs, emails, confidential emails, um, interviews, anonymized equality monitoring data, and manual filing systems, even the ones in cabinet. It's not just only about the um, automated processing, but it involves manual processing as well. Now, what the law has done is it's now separated another categories of data called, we call it special categories of data in Europe, we call it sensitive categories of data in Nigeria. Those data, they need extra security. And the reason is because when there's a data leak or when there's a data breach, the impact that it would have on the stakeholders is higher. So those categories of data include racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious, political beliefs, trade union membership, genetic or biometric data, health data, sex life or sexual orientation and criminal offenses or convictions. Now, who are your stakeholders and what, what do they mean? The stakeholders, the reason why this is there is for a, from, from a liability perspective. Now, your stakeholders are the data subject. That means the people that you actually process their personal data. Your data subject includes your employees, your customers, your um, suppliers, their email address, their names and all those things. They are the data um, subject, and it's just an individual person, citizen of Nigeria. Now, data controllers 
on the other hand, they own all the risk when it comes to data protection within their business. Data protection are in institutions, organizations, businesses that process the personal data and they also determine on why they are processing it and how they are processing it. So they determine the purpose. The data protection officer is also a stakeholder. It, data protection officer is someone that is recruited within the organization or within the data controller um, business to oh, responsible for overseeing data protection practices within that organization. So they give advice to see whatever you're doing, if, if it's in line with the regulation. Now, a data processor, however, is a third party that the data controller uses to process personal data for a specific, specific purpose on their behalf. Now, the reason why this is there is from a liability perspective. So I'll give you an example. If you're using someone to do a credit check for you, and there's a data breach in their organization that you have no control over. You as a data controller, because you determine the purpose, you're still gonna be liable, you're still gonna, if you get fined, you're still gonna pay the fine. So what happens to the data processor that that thing actually happened in the organization, what happens? And that is why this is there from a liability perspective. There's a lot of things that you can put in place to ensure that the um, liability is transferred to them. But for the purpose of time, I'm not going into that today. Now, the other part, other stakeholders is called the regulatory authority. Now, the regulatory authority, which I call data authority, in Nigeria, the, it's called NITDA, which is the National um, Information Technology Development Agency. It is a public institution monitoring the implementation of the NDPR. I've been talking about processing. Processing is not just storing, it's not just using. Processing itself, it covers a wide range of operations performed on a personal data, and that includes collecting, recording, organization, st structuring, storage, adaptation, alteration, retrieval, consultation, use, disclosure by transmission, dissemination, alignment or combination, and other things like that. So basically, we use the term data lifecycle management in this format, which means from the time you create or you collect the personal data to the time you delete the personal data, you are responsible for whatever happens to that personal data as a data controller. Now, what NDPR has brought on from GDPR as well, both of them, they've got it, is organizations need to show that they're using personal data that they collect in the data lifecycle management uh, properly. And the way they can show it is they, they say, we're not going to give them powers, so we're going to put, give them restrictions on how they can process personal data and why. Now, the which is what we call the principle. And the first principle is personal data shall be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner in relation to the data subject, which means you must have a lawful basis for collecting the personal data in the first place. If you don't have any reason or any lawful basis, you should not collect any personal data. Then the second principle is personal data shall be collected for specified explicit and legitimate purpose and not for that process. So in this, in, what it, this means is that you just collect personal data for a specific purpose and you should only use it for that purpose. If you're going to change the purpose, you need to ask for a new legal basis or you need to delete. Then the third principle is it shall be adequate, relevant and limited. So what this just means is you should not collect more than what you require. So if for example, someone is looking for a job and the only thing before the interview stage where you need is a CV, you should not be asking for their uh, passport number, you should not be asking for next of kin because they've, they've not even gotten the job yet. Then personal data shall, the next principle is it shall be accurate and when necessary kept up to date. Now this, in, this is very important in this, it's called data accuracy principle. In the sense that a data that is, which data is value, data is money to organizations and money and any inaccurate data, they will not bring you any money because you can't use it. So the question is, why are you still keeping it? From a business perspective, you're still keeping inaccurate data that is, you're paying for the um, storage facility, but it's not making any value to you, it's not making any benefit. That's from a business perspective. From a legal perspective, it is because if the data is not up to date, then you're technically in breach because you have no lawful basis for it. You have no purpose for it. Um, then the other one is storage limitation which is data retention. We call it data retention. What it means is, which is ties back to the data lifecycle management. Once you collect it, once you've used it, once you've stored it, once you finish with the data, 
Next thing you need to do is you need to delete it. Because if you don't delete it, you're going to be in breach of the lawfulness, you're going to be in breach of the specific purpose, you're going to be in breach of data minimization. And also, if you don't delete it and there's a data breach, the level of fine, they use the volume of data, for example, that has been leaked out into the um, in, in outside. And if you have 2,000 data, for example, that is not useful to you, one, you're paying for the storage, which is going to cost the organization. Two, there's a data bit that you're going to pay fine on data that is not making money for you. Then there's no point. And then integrity and confidentiality. Personal data shall be processed with appropriate security, including protection against unauthorized, unlawful processing, accidental loss. Now, I'm not going to go too much into this because my colleague that is coming afterwards will be talking about cybersecurity, but this is what cybersecurity is all about. And we call it, we use a term called technical and organizational measures, which is access controls, um, locked desk, and, and other examples. But that is just what it means that whatever data that you use, you need to take care of it until at least you delete it. Nothing must happen to it. Now, this part is the accountability principle, which I explained before. The accountability principle requires you and the organization to take responsibility for what you do with personal data and how you comply with other principles. You must have appropriate measures and records in place to be able to demonstrate compliance. So examples would be policies, processes, procedures. Which is, and then the final one is data subject rights. It's giving the data subject, which is the stakeholders that you process their personal data rights, which is they can come to you to say, delete my data. Um, they can object to, they can ask for the copy of data that you hold. And then under the NDPR as well, you need to inform them what data you collect, why you collect it, and how long you hold it for, which is on previous notice that is going to be on your website. So I will go into data breach or security incidents, really, which is NDPR defines personal data breach as a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, disclosure, or access to personal data, which is what I explained, part of the security part. Now, what why this one is separate is because the NDPR has said, NDPR, GDPR, privacy laws, they've put it separately because this is quite important, is that there is a self-reporting mechanism that you need, to, that organizations need to be aware. So if there's a data breach or there's a hacking that has gone into your system, you need to inform NITDA within 72 hours. If you do, what they will do is they will come and audit your organization, they will audit your processes to see if you have all the procedures and the processes and policies in place that normally would have reduced or stopped the risk in the first place. If you do, then that's a mitigating factor. If you don't, obviously that's an aggravating factor and your fine could be up to 10 million naira or 2%. Now, what, what businesses need to do to be compliant, really? The first thing we normally say is you need to raise an awareness within your organization so that people will know that there's something called data privacy, they need, which is the privacy by impact and um, default and design that everything they do, they need to start thinking about data privacy. Then the next thing you need to do is you need to gather it in together and evaluate the risk and perform gap analysis within your organization. Really what it does is it goes through all the business processes that you have within your organization. And then it compares it with the NDPR regulation requirements. And then whatever gaps are there, they will put it together to fix it. Then once you do that, you need to develop a roadmap, which is you need to develop what you need to do to fix the gaps, what policies you don't have, what processes you don't have, what procedures you don't have, and then bring it in line with NDPR. And after you've done all those things, then the next thing you need to do is to train people on the new processes, procedures in line with your business processes so that everything they do departmental wise or from a um, board level, um, decisions they make would be in line with regulation and they will always be putting privacy by in, um, default and privacy, privacy by design. And then the final one is monitor and report progress and compliance. Now, what it comes to when it comes to data pr protection um, or privacy, it is not a fixed thing, it is ongoing. There's a lot of um, new other laws that are brought out in line with NDPR or that corresponds with it. But how do you measure compliance? How do you measure the progress within your organization? How do you measure where you start or where you are or how, how compliant you are? Now, 
the next, what I'm going to be talking about when it comes to monitor and progress and compliance, I will be talking briefly on the standards that you can use, the framework, the standards and the framework that you can use. Now, which is why I called it uh, performance measurement of privacy within your business. Now, the first one is the regulatory privacy framework. Now, that one is just what has been done. That is just a framework that has been prepared by NITDA or ICO in the UK, for example, or the data protection regulation in whatever country it is. What they've done is just the summary of, this is what you need to do to comply with the regulation. That's it, which is what I've explained before. However, what, uh, there is something called standards. Now, what standards do is, is the, the difference between standards and regulatory privacy framework is, the regulatory privacy framework is only applicable to that regulation within that country. So for example, NDPR in Nigeria, there's a framework for it. GDPR in Europe, there's a framework for it. However, what standards do is it's taking a lot of all these frameworks and it's brought up different, uh, like a standard, international acceptable standards that you can try to emulate. And when you can em emulate that, you can show whatever regulation that, whatever regulator that comes to you that I am meeting the standards. So that means you've met some of the regulatory framework. And the examples include ISO 27001, which is mostly for information security. ISO 27701, which is a privacy standard, specifies requirements and provides guidance for establishing, implementing, maintaining, continually improving a privacy information management system. Now, the final one is a privacy program framework, which is also a framework, but the difference is this one is a managerial level framework. So it is the implementation and the maturity roadmaps that provide a structure or checklist to guide businesses through the project or the privacy management. There are many frameworks which they have slightly different purposes, which is examples would be NIST privacy framework, which is a voluntary rule to developed in collaboration with stakeholders to identify and manage privacy risk in product and services while pro protecting individual privacy. There's also the AICPA and the CICA, which is the Canadian Institute Privacy Framework. This one is just a guidance based on the generally acceptable principles, which is uh, lawfulness, accuracy, which I explained before, to assist organization in strengthening their privacy policies and procedures. Now, what the difference, the difference is this. With NIST, it's talking about what you need to do as a business, which is you need to get a team together, you need to, it measures up the project itself up until the stage where your business is good. That means you have defined, and I will explain what it means. That's why I put maturity levels. The maturity levels in all these frameworks, they've put them into ad hoc, repeatable, defined, managed, and optimized. Now, I will explain what that means briefly. Now, ad hoc, what it means is, yes, we know about privacy, but we've just done the um, regulation but we don't actually have um, data owners or we don't have information owners or we've not assigned responsibilities to people. That is ad hoc. That means the key features is it, you know, it's not gonna be efficient. There's not gonna be owner. So if there, is a, if there is a problem with that information, who is gonna be held liable? Because if you don't have that um, structure or tree within your organization to assign ownership to task, then the overall responsibility will go back to the board. I associate the residual risk. Now, the second part is reputable, which means you have ownership assigned to the role, but the ownership that has been assigned to that role or the process, they actually don't understand what they need to do. Then you have policies, you have procedures, but they actually still don't understand it. It's just been written, but it's not being communicated. Now, the third one is proactive, defined, and implemented. The fourth one is very good, which is managed. That means you've done all those, you've proactively, you've defined it, you've implemented it within your organization. People know what they need to do. People know their responsibilities and their risk. Then the next, next stage will now be managing it, which is you're going to be doing training and awareness every year. You're going to be, you're going to put in standards in, press, uh, in place from a board level to say, this is what we expect you to be. This is what we expect you to do. And then the final one is the um, excellent, which is optimized, which means you have a metric that you then use to measure up everything you've done from stage one to four. 
so in 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 essence what it means what what i've just said so far is that the responsibility lies starts with the board and it filters them because if they don't um we call it a uh, top-down approach because if they don't put plans in place to to f to get to a proper appropriate teams proper dpo in place that would advise them proper decision making powers then unfortunately the organization will be technically in breach thank you thank you mr Deshaer. <laughs> um we have a lot of questions but we won't take them now because we would want uh, mr walter to take his session now so mr walter Ayeton, we are ready for you uh, mr Deshaer, if you can just stop sharing your screen so that You need to unmute your microphone. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, I was trying I'm to sorry, share. Sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. Just before you start, um, mm -hmm. we're going to be taking all the questions together, both um, the questions regarding data protection and cybersecurity immediately after Mr. Walter's session. So please, if you have questions, now will be the best time to send them in. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Fantastic. Thanks, um, Adetayo. Uh, please, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Yes, Thank we can. You. Okay. Cool. So um good afternoon everyone. Um my name is Walter Aitan. I'll be talking about um implementing effective implementing structures for effective um cyber security. Um so I'm a cyber security architect, consultant, and I've um worked as, as head of cyber um over the last twenty years. Um, I provide uh, most of my clients are Fortune 100 companies, and um, but I've also worked with small and medium enterprises as well. So, so I've got a um, full breadth of um, some of the pains that organizations go through um, to 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 deal with cyber. Um, but you're not here to hear about me. You're here to um, understand um, how we can implement structures for cyber. And I think, um, as with everything, let's start with taxonomy. So, what is um, cyber security um, so there are multiple um ways these um, cyber security is defined and and i think um just a simple and a, a quick um sort of um delineation of, uh, via venn diagram will, will bring this out so so information means um, what you have um your your data and you know that data can be stored on paper it can be stored in your computer it can be stored um anywhere um so there's information security um, and, and a subset of information security means um, you have some digital information in your in your in your organization uh, but we also have cyber which is beyond just information it, it encompasses some information and primarily digital information but we have things um, in addition to it so um, storage devices as uh, my colleagues have mentioned networks cloud services anything that um, is outside the control of your organization so uh, we're not trying to split hairs but i think when you're having as leaders when you're having conversations with your smes uh, make sure that you're not um, comparing um, oranges to apples now um so let, let's start with just some really um good misconceptions that um i'm sure some of you will share um which, which are, are, and it's very common with, with leadership so so the first one is um cyber security is actually complex i, I don't think i understand it so um as with everything else, um, sea level, board level, they, they, um, you guys tend to just stay away from cyber because you feel it's complex. And, and, and I think um, what, what you need to understand, it's, it's like any other practice within your organization. You, you don't need to be a technical expert to make a, an informed decision. All you need is insight. So make sure you have the right tools, the right people to give you just enough information you need to be able to make your um, decisions. Um, the, the second one is, um, cyber attacks are quite sophisticated there's literally nothing i can do to stop them so um what i'll um what i'll say on that point is uh, make sure you have a, a methodical approach to cyber so so like as with everything you know break it down um similar to the um to the first point where you know you don't need to understand all your accounting processes all your invoices there are people that do that but you have processes where you've broken down um the, the full process and you're able to you know um if there's a decision and you need to come back in to say okay why was this decision taken um you can 
go back to the metrics and say, okay, yeah, this is the data that informed that decision. So break it down, make sure you have um, an approach and, and deal with them in small chunks uh, to greatly reduce your risk. And, um, and to be honest, if, if, um, if you do the little things, the small things, um, there's a um, there's a proper saying out there that just, um, I'm, I'm going a bit technical, but we have some technical controls. And if you implement just five of them, very basic controls, simple things, you know, you stop it 5% of cyber attacks. So try and always um, take your baby steps, break your entire process into small logical flows and understand um, which ones make sense and which ones don't. Um, and, and then the, the third misconception that I'll take is um, actually um, uh, cyber attacks are targeted. I'm not... Um, Barclays, I'm not Zenit Bank, I'm not HSBC, I'm not GTB, so um, my organization is fine. Um, but, but most attacks are, are opportunistic in nature. So people just um, look for the weakest link in any organization. I mean, sometimes I sit down on my home broadband and I just look at who's um, knocking at my broadband from the external. And people are constantly scanning the internet just to see, hmm, is there a vulnerability I can take? Some of them do it for fun. Others do it, you know, for monetary reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So um, try and um, overcome some of these misconceptions if you can. Now, um, just a simple um, quote from um, the CISO for Society General. He said, um, look, it takes 20 years to build a reputation as a business, but a few minutes of cyber incident can ruin it. So um, security and cybersecurity is a business enabler. You, you, you've done a hard work in your organization. You have people that have put in years, you know, to get your product, your service to where it is. Don't, don't let, you know, someone just spoil it, it, it with, with an opportunistic attack in, in 10 minutes. So um, I thought that was a nice one. So I'll be talking about some pillars that I think will um, um, help you. There's so much you can say in 20 minutes, but I'll, I'll try and um, just whiz through this um, and, and I'll take questions um, hopefully towards the end. Um, so, so what are some of the things you can do? And I asked myself, if I was attending a seminar like this, what, what do I want to get from it? So I want to give you just little tips and bits that you can take back to organizations and begin to drive conversations. So, um, and, and, so, and these pillars will help you and formulate those conversations if you don't already have them. And if you do, you can enrich them, improve them, and make sure that they are fit for purpose. So and the first pillar um, on my screen is um, make sure you embed cybersecurity into your structure and objectives. Um, Prof um, just mentioned it. Um, Adesha also mentioned it as well. So cybersecurity impacts every aspect of your organization. Don't think that there's an aspect that, it, that is not impacted unless you have, you're still working manually, and the your, your all your entries and you know storage is is on manual paper. And even if you even if you're working with those types of processes, then you should be looking at information security. How are we storing those sheets of paper? Is the file cabinet safe? Who has access to it? How is it backed up? If there's a fire there, you know how how is that managed? So uh, manage it properly. Um, ensure it's make sure that your um, cybersecurity is integrated into your organizational risk and your decision-making process. So um, for you to do this, um, you, you have to have um, not just good technology, but uh, you need to have people. Um, I'm sure you all know people, process, technology, and governance. Um, you need to have the right processes and you also need to um, manage it. So remember, a lot of organizations have one person who, who does the entire cyber, but cyber is the responsibility of leadership. Make sure you know who's responsible for what, when. Now, the second pillar um, I, I'll, I'll talk about is um, what matters to you. So I, I think, um, and, and I'll mention this in other slides, you, you can't protect everything. Nobody can protect everything, no matter how much you have. If you have unlimited budget, you still cannot protect everything because the vectors are changing, the threat actors are changing, your organizational structure is, is changing. So, so what do you do? Um, you, you have to do two things very quickly. Um, you have to establish what your baseline is. Um, know yourself as an organization and then identify what your crown, crown jewels are. So what's important to you? What, what if, if it gets stolen, if it gets missing, or if someone has access to it, um, what would be the impact of that thing? And it differs. You know, some organizations is data, as, as I just said. Um, some organizations, you, 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 have, um, you have actually proper, critical, um, unique solutions. And you don't want anyone laying their hands on that. If they do and it gets into the hand of your competitors, then it's almost game over. Other organizations, you know, it, it can be anything. But you have to identify what is your crown jewel. Without knowing what your crown jewel is, honestly, you, you would have already failed before you started. So um, why do you need this? You need to understand what your technical assets are from a cyber point of view. Um, how are they critical to your organization? And 
you know, this all feeds into your risk management process, you know. So what, what's your technical landscape? Which components of your system host your most critical objectives? And then that's what you now need to zoom in on and ensure that is secure. First of all, then you can look at everything else. Everyone has, you know, um, a constraint on budget. So um, being able to, you know, from a priority and point of view, risk rate, what you want to protect is a big help. So always remember that as with all business risk, you know, your organization will not be able to mitigate all cyber risk at a time. So identify your crown jewels and make sure you secure them adequately. It also helps you um, put your business case to your board or to your management if you need to get extra funding. Um, pillar three, so understand your, your threat. So every organization faces different types of threats. So you need to, you know, and as leadership, um, your approach to cyber will differ. So, so the controls you would have in a financial service might be different from education, which will be different from healthcare, which will be different from education, you know, all sorts of verticals. So understand the types of threats that would fit, that would hit your organization. These threats, there are patterns to them. Uh, and if you look online, you can get very quickly, okay, we, my organization, what types of attacks do we generally face? And you get that data, you know, uh, and also um, it, um, understand the threats, um, faced by your organizations, either directly or by virtue of who you work with. So you might not even have direct threats, but you might be working with a partner or you might have a third party relationship and, and they are a target. And sometimes if, if, if the um, adversarial actors try to get into their systems, they can't be like, hmm, company X has a relationship with company Y. Let, let's try company, we've tried company Y, their, their security controls are quite tough. We can't get in, let's try company X. And then they now use you as a route through the organization. So make sure you, you understand your threat landscape, understand you know, the people that you're working with, the organizations, you work with. So, so um, think about threats um, and with regards to what you're trying to defense against. So it needs to really, you need to give it thought and then understand the risk um, you're trying to defend um, and you're trying to protect. Or as I said, you cannot protect everything. If you try to protect everything, you will protect nothing. So you, you need to be quite um, methodical in that sense as well. So um, as I said, um, organizations in the same line of business will face similar threats. So peer review, speak to your colleagues in other organizations and make sure that they, um, they understand, you know, um, ask them what they're facing, share what you're facing and continue, you know, trying to um, leverage on their experience, on their exposure, and also on their controls as well. Um, the next pillar is um, a risk management process. So yeah, everything is risk-based. Your, your decision as leaders will always be risk-based. So um, a good risk management process will make you better and it will help you make more informed decisions. Uh, and I'm sure most organizations already have a risk management framework for depending on what they do. So all you just need to do is, you know, plug cyber in. So say to your um, cyber guys, okay, how do we, and what are our risks? You know, get the templates out. What, what framework are we going to use? You have some good ones there, ISO 27005, 31. 100. These are all free utilities and um, resources you can get online. And then say, okay, let, let's, let's customize this for our organization. What do we know? What do we care about? How do we want to track this? And how do we want to, you know, um, um, how do we want to uh, put the rating, the risk rating on it so that we know how we, um, how we implement or how we fix. So a strong risk, a lot of organizations have noticed risk is always a tick box. So yeah, 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 tick, 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 we've done our risk. But no, um, you can get a lot of value from an insight from your risk management process. So if you don't have one, make sure you um, ensure that your risk governance is, is well in place um, and then plug your cybersecurity risk into your organizational risk governance um, process. So um, if there's anything um, you're going to remember, so a few things I've, I've noticed, it's not about just reducing risk, it's about having a holistic risk view so that it informs decision, it informs the tool you get, it informs the services you get, it informs, and you're able, to, I've noticed the organizations that take a more robust risk, um, risk approach are able to take better decisions from a cybersecurity technology point of view. Because if there are tools that will solve cyber cybersecurity problem, we won't be having this conversation. We'll just go buy a pane of glass and that's it, problem over. But as you all know, we all still have incidents. There are incidents every day, every week, every month. So we have to constantly adapt and evolve because that's what the adversaries are doing. So be realistic about your risk. Don't sweep it under the rug and don't think your risk is a measure of your success or failure. Just be honest about it and, and, and feed it properly. 
Now, um, you now need to have your controls, which is your cybersecurity measures. They have to be effective, and, and I can't say that enough. So what, when you've identified your assets, when you've identified your crown jewels, when you've identified what, what, what makes sense to you, what is important to your objectives, what is the thing we really want to protect, then you go in and you implement your security measures. Now, implementing, um, if you put in place um, good defenses, um, you, you have to put them against your biggest threat. So it, it means you, you're able to meet your regulatory compliance. As Adi just said, when you get, um, if, if and when you get compromised, that's the first thing you do. You say, okay, look, we've taken due diligence, we've taken due care. We've done this, we've done that. We've put this control, we've tested it. And, and when you do that, it reduces your liability, I believe. I mean, Adi would keep me on the straight and narrow, but I believe it reduces your liability than if they came in and they said, oh, actually, do you have, you know, what? show me the basic controls around that storage area. And you don't even have simple encryption of data at rest. Then it shows that you've not, um, you've not taken due diligence and due care with their data or with people's data that you're holding. So make sure that you measure, um, you, you, your, your security measure is, is, um, is effective and is effectual. Don't just do it as another tick, tick box because if you do that, it will reduce, you have to make it hard for, for the adversary. So it's called defense in debt. So they try, even if they break in through the front door, you know, they, they, if they come in through your gate, they shouldn't be there in the compound, yes, but they shouldn't be able to enter your house. If they enter your house, they shouldn't be able to enter your kitchen for, for those of you that, you know, have a nice and locked kitchen. And if they enter your kitchen, they definitely, you don't want them in your room. So, so you have to layer your defenses and ensure that if they break one level of, um, defense, they're able to, you have something else that sort of catches them and, notify, and notifies you. So, so some practical advice. So remember your baseline, um, make sure that you, you, you strengthen your defense based on your high priority um, risk. As I've said, layer your defense and also remember you have insider threats. So some of your adversaries may already be in your organization. So how do you protect against um, insider threats? Think about it and then constantly review and assess your security measures. Um, so we're almost there. Um, another pillar is um, security. Uh, you plan for cybersecurity incidents. Now, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the NIST framework. So it says identify, protect, um, detect, respond, and recover. It's called the NIST five steps. It's a good framework that you can use. There are many other frameworks, but I, I like this. So when you think of um, this um, planning for cybersecurity, planning your response, you, you can see in this framework, two of the controls are identify and protect. I've talked about identify, what are crown jewels, protect, what are your controls? But you have three that are really key. You have to, once someone's in, once someone is in your network, you have to know, you know, and, and, and I'm stressing this because it's a big issue in the industry globally. So, so on average, it took 206 days for people to identify that they had been breached. That's 6.9 months, which is totally unacceptable. And on average, and the average time to contain a breach is about 2.4 months. So as soon as someone who is not meant to be in your network is there, you need to know. So that's where the detect, respond, and recover controls come in. And you cannot do this without good um, incident management. So if there's anything you're going to do, make sure that you have an incident management plan, you have a good SOC, you have some SIM tools, you're collecting all your logs, such that if you see an anomalous behavior or traffic flow or pattern, you know, your, your tools will say, hmm, something is wrong here. And once you detect that, then you can get your SMEs to swing into action and investigate what that is. You have to understand your role as a leader in, in, um, in, in management and, and make sure that you um, test your plan, get involved in the exercises, and there is a no blame culture. When you're breached, you need to make sure that everyone, you know, is able to come out and say, okay, this is where I, I, I failed. This is my, um, this is where the control failed. This is where we failed as a team. And don't punish them for that because if you punish them as a leader, uh, what would happen is the next time there's a breach, they will try to, um, they will try to, um, hide that breach from you, and, and that's not good for your organization. So you, you have to, you know, make sure that you have your incident response plan um, ready and, and good to go, and ensure that all your um, stakeholders understand what the plan is, who is doing what, and when. Oh, sorry, apologies. I think I just lost my share. Um, so um, what, what I'll do is I'll try and um, share this. I'll try and share the the slides. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. Now, um, cybersecurity is everyone's um, cybersecurity is everyone's concern, everyone's effort. 
Um, you as a leader, you're ultimately responsible. No one's going to take that responsibility for you. When the auditors come knock, knocking, when the um, investigators come in, it's, it's your name. You're accountable and you're responsible. So um, be comfortable with cyber and try and learn a bit more um, and then try and begin to take some baby steps. You know, NIST five um, CIS, the first five controls, they are very, very easy, you know, literally. And you can get those sorted in, you know, a six month program, get those in, then it's 5% of your, you know, your patching, your inventory, all sorted and, and you're good to go. So thanks for your time. And then I'll take questions if any. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Walter. We already have a lot of questions. You made me very afraid. I mean, we might as well just start storing our data and information in our desk so, because the exposure risk is too much. Okay, so I'm going to take the first question, which is for Mr. Adeyemi. Um, it's a two-part question. How long should an organization keep data? And is the right of a data subject, is it the right of a data subject to determine that their data be deleted absolutely? I will start with the data subject rights. Um, the request of a data subject for a deletion is not absolute, no. Um, there are other, so for example, there are other regu um, laws that requires you, for example, finance laws that requires you to keep financial data for seven years. And if someone comes in and say, delete my financial data, you have a legal obligation which triumphs over the data subject right in that regard. However, the, what needs to be determined at that point is what data sets or what categories of data are you processing about the person? So if, if there has to be a process in place, there has to be a procedure in place that you'll be able to determine that. So, um, but to answer your questions, no, it is not absolute. Okay, then the, thank you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. Then the second question, which is how long should you keep data for, which is all, um, almost similar. That would depend on a lot of factors. And that would, number one, it would depend on what business area within your organization, what purpose are you, what, what purpose did you collect the data for? And is there any other reasons why you can you, you need to keep the data? Now, obviously, in all the laws, when you're talking of HR laws and labor laws, you're talking of um, was it what, uh, financial laws, you're talking of criminal laws, there are laws that says you need to keep data for this amount of time, six years, seven years. But most times, as you can see, most people would not say you should keep data for more than seven years. And the reason is because of something called Limitations Act. That means if there's a problem, if someone has a, um, an issue with your organization, under the civil law, they only have six years to bring a claim against the organization. So on average, we normally recommend that organization data or personal information should be kept for maximum number of seven years. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this is an interesting question. How can the data controller, this question is also for you, Mr. Adesha, so please don't go away. How can the data controller transfer the liability on data? I mean, <laughs> is it even possible for you to transfer liability and when it comes to data and how can you transfer the liability? It is possible to transfer liability. But there's something, it's through a contractual means. Now, there's something in every contract that normally it's recommended when you're signing with your data processors. We call it a data processing agreement or an addendum that you need to incorporate into the contract. Now, what it means is after you have the main master service agreement, you now incorporate data protection clauses that says, this is the service you're providing for us. Now, these are the requirements that you need to meet when you're providing the services or giving us a product, or for example. And that includes a liability clause that's specifically for um, personal data. So what we normally do, or what I normally advise companies is, number one, your liability clause in your data processing addendum or agreement should be separate from your liability clause in the master service agreement. And the reason is because liabilities clause in the master service agreement can be limited to 
well, from 1,000 naira to 1 million to 10 million, it depends on the organization. Whereas the liability clause in the data protection can actually be the maximum of what you could be fined if something happens to that data. So yes, you can transfer that liability down to the data processor. Although if something happens, you're the one as the data controller, they will come and meet. You're the one they will, for lack of words, throw the book at. But what it in effect does is when they, when they do something, when they find you, you can then sue or counter sue in that same manner, the data processor to say, you've breached our contract and you two, you're going to be liable for the fine. Okay, thank you very much. This next question is for Mr. Walter. It's very long. I'm going to try and read it verbatim. To ensure that there is an effective implementation of cybersecurity strategy, what governance structure should all organizations put in place to ensure that there is ownership, accountability, and responsibility in achieving the expectations of zero attack, a full assurance of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of institutional digital assets? Are there valued documentations that will guide this compliance and what should they contain? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so it's a long question and um, it's quite winded. So yes, so you, you have, um, so security is in layers and you start from the top down. Um, so you, you need to start with your um, strategy. So what's your information security strategy? And that, and that needs to be at, at board level, um, which is signed by your CEO. It's just a one pager, a one, um, two pagers. Now, once you, once you get that um, strategy document signed, uh, what we generally do is um, you now do what is called the capability maturity model. You look at your organization and say, okay, how mature are we? Where are we now? Where do we want to do? Where do we want to get to? Where do we want to be? And, and um, based off, off of that um, CMM, um, I've put a link to his, to the CMM site in my in my um, PowerPoint, and I'll um, pass it on to, to be shared to you guys if, if you need to do some further digging. And based on that, you now create a roadmap or a security plan to say, okay, we're at point A, we need to get to point B. But keep in mind that it's been driven from your your senior leadership, and I believe um, Prof covered some of this in her own. Um, session as well. Once you now have that roadmap, then you now begin to spin off programs. Um, and when you spin off programs, those programs will need teams. So you now need to have your security organization, um, which is led by a responsible person, we call him a CISO or a head of cyber. Um, you have some um, SMEs, an architect, it, it depends. And you can have one person wear multiple hats. It all depends. Your organizational co context will determine how you proceed. But from a top level, you know, a strategy, um, maturity, plan, and then you now spin off your programs of the plan. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you, Walter. Um, the next question I have is for you, um, Mr. Adesheye. How do we reconcile the data life cycle management principle that says that we must delete user data once we're done with it? Um, in the event of fraud, how do we know if we've deleted those data in the past? How do we know that, how, how would this be possible if we have deleted the user data? Thank you for that. Now, um, the, which is data life cycle management, data retention, and the data subject right to deletion, they all work hand in hand. But they all have the same principle. And the first principle is this. I have a data, I've used it, I've finished using it. Then the next question is, is there anything within the law that says I need to keep this data for this amount of time? Now, to now tie it to that question, how long can someone bring a fraud, fraudulent claim against your organization? It is going to be six years. So, the, but, and then the second question would be, if someone brings a fraudulent claim against your organization, what type of data, what type of evidence would you need to show? So, which I will now explain why, why I asked that question in the sense that and an example would be if you have a customer. Now, before the customer or a client comes to your organization, the first thing you would do is you would collect their basic data. We call it basic data, which is just their names, email address, to be able to have a, um, a communication, a business communication with them. Then from that stage, you have the business communications, which is the emails that has gone back and forth, which is another set of data. 
And then you now have, if they now take up your services, you now have other data sets that or categories of data that you need to be, you need to collect for the purpose of the service. There are different stages. Now, if, if you finish using, if for example, you don't have any relationship with a person anymore and you, they've come to say delete my data. You need to go through all those categories of data or the data set to determine if there's a real, if there is a problem with the contract I get sued today, which one am I going to use for um, as evidence? Obviously, some of the emails, it would just be normal emails to negotiate or something that might not be relevant. So of course you can delete those ones. But what about the ones that are pertinent to your business, which is contract, which is the uh, payment invoices. Obviously, you cannot delete those ones. Now, remember the data lifecycle management is when you have finished the purpose or using the data. The purpose has not been finished. And it, the purpose is still um, there, it's still ongoing because you're preventing fraud. So, uh, and I hope that I've answered your question. Okay, thank you, Ms. Adesha. The next question is for you, Mr. Walter. Please, do we have the capacity and av availability of cyber risk insurance in Nigeria? I'm going to take two questions together just because of time. That, that both for you, Mr. Walter. How can we, how can captive portal control cyber attack? One. And how do we have the capacity and availability of cyber risk insurance in Nigeria? Cool. Um, two very good questions. So, um, for, for the um, re in relationship to cyber risk, um, I, I don't know if the if the insurance companies in Nigeria offer um, cyber insurance, but it might be worth. Um, um, that, that I know there's an there's an there's a framework I read on on the need. For, for the same. So, so I would say, speak to your, if you have, if you're an organization and you have a relationship with your insurer, just speak to them and say, look, ca can we insure against cyber risk? Um, it's quite common over here, but I don't know what is on ground, but that's a conversation to have with your um, insurance. And, and I think it's a well, it, it's, it's well worth um, that conversation. Um, the, the second question is, um, um, control, sorry, the questions are scrolling. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I've lost the question now. Oh, okay. Um, control capacity. Do we have control capacity? Yeah. Okay, for captive portal, I remember now. Okay, fantastic. So if you remember, as I said, there's no captive portals have their own place um, when, you're, uh, when you're trying to fulfill guest access. But it, try, and, try and think of a layered defense um, and, and think of the analogy I gave where someone gets into your compound, they shouldn't get into your house. If they get into your house, they shouldn't get into your kitchen. If they get into your kitchen, they shouldn't get into your room. So layer your defenses, have your perimeter, have your DMZ, have your internal, then you get down to the application level and then you secure the application or the data itself. Don't, um, don't rely on just one um, control to secure your organization. So there are multiple controls and captive portal is one of them but um, there's no single control that will fix all your problems. There's no silver bullet in that sense of the word. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have this two part question. There are two separate questions but I'm going to take them together. Mr. Adeshe, what is the deadline for submitting data protection audit reports? And does NITDA have a template to guide organizations who are submitting or rendering reports? To submit for this year, it is the 30th of June, which is about three days ago. And you have to submit subsequently I'm every sorry. year. I'm sorry we didn't get that. Could, could you okay. repeat? Sorry. Um, you, you're supposed to submit by the 30th of June, which was about three days ago. And every year, you're supposed to submit on or before the 15th of March. Do they have a template? Oh, what happened? Babe. Oh, Ellen? Okay, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry. I thought it was my internet. I mean, my Zoom down.
Okay, um, while Mr. Deshaye sorts his internet um, issues, Mr. Walter, there's another question here for you. Yeah. What certifications or information resources can one use to gain knowledge on cybersecurity? Uh, another good question. So loads. Um, so it depends again, sorry, I'm not being an architect, but it really depends. Um, cybersecurity is broad. Um, so you have offensive, you have defensive, you have security management, you have forensics. So it depends on the area you're interested in. So um, there, there are, and those certifications will be dependent on the line you want to go through. Now, if you're thinking about it from an organizational context, you need multiple. So you need someone um, in security management, you need one or two people um, that are security architects or engineers, then you need at least a SOC. Um, and, and once in a while, you can hire a red team to come in and, and run some penetration testing. Um, personally, I have, um, I have, <sighs> Um, I have ISO, I have CISSP, CSSLP, AWS Security, Azure Security, PCIP. Um, I, I have more certifications than I can count, but it's not about the certification. It, it's about what do you, if from a personal point of view, what do you want to do? What are you interested in? And but from an organizational point of view, always think that you need multiple skill sets. Um, there, there's no one size fits all. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. The questions are coming fast and I'm not sure we'll be able to take all of those questions, but let me take one more for you. Speaking to the CEOs, how do you, how, how should they manage third party risk associated with providing cybersecurity assurance, especially with large dependence in collaboration with vendors and third parties who have built superior capacity in providing cyber defense capabilities? And that's an awesome question, and 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 some of these questions, honestly, I wish I had the answer to. I'll be I'll be super rich if I did. So um, it shows that you know a lot of um, the people on the call understand what they're doing and and the challenges ahead. Now, third-party risk is very interesting and complex. And yes, you're correct. There, there's um, there are times where your controls are of a higher nature than than some of your third parties, and there are times where the controls are lower. So the first thing I would say is anytime you're engaging a third party, um, hopefully when a day comes, um, you can expand on that. Make sure you do at least um, some due diligence. Understand who they are, understand um, what their capabilities are, ask them about their controls, ask them about certifications. The, the, the two common ones are SOC, SOC 2, and ISO. So say, please, are you SOC 2 ISO compliant? And if not, just say, look, just, just show us your architecture and then show us the controls you have there. Um, th th there's a lot you can do. Um, from a contractual point of view, there are some things you must do to show that you have done due diligence. But beyond the contractual, um, it, it's, it's up in the air. Uh, and I saw someone's question. Yes, so, sometimes in Nigeria, the controls are a lot lower. Uh, but just um, what, what I would recommend is, ask the right question based on the right frameworks. And um, sometimes you might even say, okay, look, show us your environment, show us, pay them a visit um, and, and understand the controls they have around. And it will depend on your flow. Is the flow, you know, just them giving you a service? Do you have an API integration with them or are you guys sharing data? So the risk will depend on um, your relationship with them, but you have to conduct um, supplier due diligence. Now, some of the risks are a lot more complex. So for example, if they're a vendor, you know, you cannot um, say, okay, actually you're supplying me this piece of kit. I need you to um, assure that all the components used have not been, for example, I don't use any country made in Nigeria, you know, I don't, but you guys know what I mean. So um, some of those controls are a lot more um, harder to enforce uh, and you need to get business buying. But remember, it will be dependent on your risk. If you have a massive product that if, if it leaks, it will, cut, will literally bring down your organization, then yes, you may need to put in some more. But if you don't, then no, not as much. So I can share stuff on supplier due diligence if you guys reach um, through um, our data, your, just some um, things that can help you to frame your conversation with with your management thank you thank you walter i observe cyber attacks in nigeria are targeted at banks as other risks such as reputational loss are not critical in this society please is there any example of attack on a non-financial organization um good, good question and 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 it's an assumption um everything we say um, when we when we talk about some of these things are assumptions because we don't have the data to back it up. Um, and for me, if I don't see the data, then it's an assumption. Now, um, what I'll just say to that is, um, I think there, there are more cyber attacks than are being reported. Um, so what you need to do is conduct your own due diligence to find out from 
any agencies that has current data, you know, I, I know there are some data companies in Nigeria. So look, how many um, organizations, the last time I read, it was 2018, and it said over 60% of organizations have suffered a cyber breach. And, and I know banks are not 60% of organizations in Nigeria, but we don't have the data to back it up. So I can't answer that in the context of Nigeria. But what you can do, and you can't as well, but what you can do is you can say, okay, well, for my own organization, I'm, I'm going to ensure that it doesn't happen or I will try and prevent it from happening because the, the, um, the attack vectors are changing. So now I had um, a colleague who put up um, a simple instance in AWS. It was meant to cost him 11 pounds a month and he, he got a bill of 3,000 pounds. In literally a day, someone had come into his, uh, had hacked his EC2 instance and had started mining Bitcoin on it. And he had the bill and he has to pay. AWS will not say, oh, sorry, you got compromised. You're not going to pay. So just protect yourself. Uh, but from a wider context in regards to Nigeria, I don't have the data, but I think the last one I read said, um, 60 percent and and there was a um, almost a one trillion dollar cost for cyber breaches but i cannot validate either way okay thank you what are the risks associated with cloud data management and how do you protect such arrangements another good question i'm feeling like i'm in an interview now no cloud <laughs> cloud data is um so what you have to realize is controls are controls so if you have data on prem uh, the, the, the simplest way I can answer this is if you have data on-prem, you have controls around that data. So if you move that data to the cloud, all you just need to do is extrapolate those controls and see how it um, applies um, to cloud computing. Now, if, you, if anyone follows the news, you see that most of the data breaches with most of the public cloud providers um, is as a result of data stored at rest um, that was leaked. So um, you, you need to understand where you're storing it. I'm gonna use AWS as an example because that's the cloud platform I'm most familiar with. It's gonna be in an S3 bucket. How do you protect that S3 bucket? How do you ensure that you're not exposing your credentials? Do you have 2FA? You have to, there, there are policies that you can apply to that bucket which are cloud specific. But if you think about it from a principles, from a security principles point of view, it's gonna be the same cyber security principles. Where is my data stored? Who has access to it? How do I grant access to those users? How do I revoke access? Is it encrypted in transit into that storage area? Is it encrypted at rest? And what's the data lifecycle? When do I delete it and how do I delete it? I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Walter. It seems that the time needs to take a short break. Okay, so there's a, so there's a question here, I believe is for you as well. For data protection, I realize my IEEE is not added to standard. Oh, sorry, yeah. Do, does this mean that, um, what does this mean for data protection? IEEE standard is not valid. Does it mean it's not valid? I, let me just jump in on that. Okay. Um, the standard is not the law. The standard is just a, it's not about whether it is valid or not. Is a voluntary um, framework, should I say? That organization is just like ISO 27001 seal. It just says that we've complied with the um, international standards on um, security, and that is why we have the seal. So that means we've placed that we have. We want you to trust us because we've complied with the standards. That's it. But it's not um, law itself. No. It just means the principles you've, you've engaged, you've done it, you've got the standards, someone has um, seen it. That's it. But it's not, it's not necessarily whether it's right or wrong. Thank you very much. And Mr. Walter, what is the latest 2020 cybersecurity threat that companies should be wary of? Okay, um, another good question. So I tend to use the um, Verizon data breach notification. It's free online, just need to give it your name and password. And according to that, phishing is number one um, for 2020. Um, you have um, use, use of stolen cards, um, you have password dumper, you have misdelivery, um, delivery, Trojan, uh, ransomware, and RAM scrapper. But I think phishing, if there's anything, um, phishing is literally when they send 
um, emails with links to you, and then someone in your organization clicks that link and it installs malware, which now gives them a full hold. So if there's anything to remember, I'll say take phishing as the top threat um, for 2020. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question regarding that phishing. Um, so I've been, we've been trained that when you want to recognize a, a website that is um, a phished website, it usually does not have that padlock or that HTTPS. There's no S behind the HTTP. But we've realized that these days there are websites that have the padlock and the HTTPS and they are still phished websites. They are cloned websites. How else, apart from the basics, what are the basics in recognizing a website that has been cloned? Uh, that, that's a good question. And um, yes, you're correct. So you having the um, HTTPS padlock sign does not mean the website is um, valid. So, so you have to have multiple controls. Now, from, from an email point of view, you should have your email controls. Um, there's Mimecast. There's, there are two, I'm not recommending any vendor. This is not a marketing. I'm not affiliated with any vendor, but this is what I've seen um, being used out there. There's Mimecast, there's Ion scale and, and these are quite robust ones they will catch a lot of those before um, you get um, before the email gets to you but i think this this comes to security awareness and training you have to train your users because most of those links um, if you try and click on them what you see is that um, i have a habit i don't click on any mail um, so i just hover around and then it will give you the real url to give you the real address it's taking you to so if, for example it says that it's supposed to be an email from a data from copgov um, ng.com once you do a mouse over you see but um more, more importantly you you have to understand that some um, you as i said you cannot mitigate against every attack you have to train your users do not click on a link so sometimes when i see a link so a good example is i have a vendor and they invite me for a conference. So the first thing I do before I click that link to register, I just pick the phone up, I ring them up, I'm like, did you send me an email? Um, do you have a conference coming up? And, and more often than not, they've confirmed, yes, we do. So I think that there's a there's certain aspect where um, there's um, um, security awareness and training for your users. Um, there, there, there are some other aspects that technical controls can um, can solve. So for security awareness and training, there's also gamification. If you guys look for it, there are some free games you can have your employees just play with to be able to identify. And in all honesty, I've taken some of those tests and I've failed them as well. And I'm a cyber security SME. So any of us can be caught out. It's just um, you're able to adapt and the more you train yourself and the attacks are getting more and more sophisticated. Okay, just before you go, this, this is for you. Which cyber attack can a legal firm experience in 2020? Uh, I don't know, but if I, if I was to guess, I would say they'll be coming after your client data. Um, so as a legal firm, you'll be dealing with um, some top clients and, and um, they, would want to, um, they would want to get some of that, those data out. I think that they might be best place to answer this, but if you said, oh, I'm a legal firm, um, cyber, um, what, what should I be worried about? I'm like, worried about your client's confidential data, because that's what they're coming after. Uh, and I know legal firms and insurance firms um, over here are one of the top spenders for cyber. Okay. Um, Adesha, please, this question is for you. Do we have a situation where data protection can be waived? How does naming and shaming how is naming and shaming compatible with data protection law? Example is publishing names of sex offenders, loan defaulters. When users give their consent to use information by organization, can you use, is this not a breach of data protection law when you publish their data? Number one, data protection cannot be waived. Um, number two, to answer that question, it all depends on the context. Now, when I, when I spoke about the legal basis, I said you have to process lawfully. Consent is not the only lawful basis. We have about six or seven, if I remember correctly. We have consent. In Nigeria, we have public interest, vital interest, contract. Um, we don't have legitimate interest. Okay, so we have all those. A lot of people think, think it's only consent, but the answer is no. If the question is, number one, if a company or if an organization is a public organization like the government parasitals, and it is ensuring the law that they have to publish certain things like the sexual offenders um, register on the website, because it is in the interest of the public to know these people so that they can save by themselves, then they're not in breach of data protection laws at all. However, if a private organization does the same thing without having any 
attitude to the business per se. There is no reason why the business would expect to get that information from them. Then they will be in the data, they will be in breach of data protection laws. Interesting. Okay, I also have a question before I take this this last question for uh, Mr. Ayeto. So, if I have as an organization, especially as a law firm. I have put in place all the processes and um, regulatory requirements for protecting the data of my clients. But somehow we still experience a breach, either as a, um, probably by a honest mistake of one of the staff or maybe like um, Walter pointed out, um, cyber malwares or attack. Am I still under any liability? Can I still get sued for yes. um, this breach? Yes. So I, I think what, what I didn't say at the beginning, um, or what we've not really talked about is data breach is into two phases. There is, and that is why I said it's technical and organizational measures. Data breach is not just um, asset breach. It's not a breach of, of hacking malware website. Data breach also has the element of um, employee sending the information to the wrong person or leaving your desk, um, you know where you normally keep paper documents, you then lock it and the cleaner comes in the middle of the night to clean your business and they see the personal data, they steal the information to use it for that. You are still going to be liable for it. So to go against that, what we normally recommend is, and that is why I'm, I can't stress this enough, the technical, that's why it's together, the technical and organizational measures. Organizational measures include plain desk policy, Make sure when you're going to the toilet, you lock your computers. Make sure when you're going home, you lock your um, desk where you keep personal data and keep the key on you at all times. Make sure you have like a screen that will cover your laptop when you're at work so that other people would not see what you're doing because the business will still be liable for it. Wow. Wow. I think that's insurance. Uh thing you mentioned earlier, Walter, I think this is where it comes to play. It's very important. I mean, I can't be paying for... Okay, this last and final question. Can licensed firewall prevent DOS attack in the position of IPS and IDS? That's for you, Mr. Ayeto. Uh, yes, it can. Um, absolutely. But as I said, please always think <clears throat> excuse me, defense in depth, have multiple controls. Um, I, I only had 20 minutes, so there, there's so much I cannot say in 20 minutes, but you need to layer your security. Just Google defense in depth, you see very good articles on it. Um, so don't just rely on your, so, so a firewall will sit on your edge or at your perimeter, um, have other controls in front of it, and other controls behind it. Now, while it can, sometimes it can be overwhelmed as well. So um, in practice, people use tools here like um, Akamai, um, which give you, um, they sit in front of your firewall and they're able to provide um, a measure of protection so it doesn't even hit your firewall. Um, and also um, a lot of the cloud providers, if, if you're thinking of migrating to cloud, will give you um, DDoS protection as standard. Thank you Hope very much. Um, yes, yes, it does actually. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have Professor Fabian Ajogu, who is a senior advocate of Nigeria here, and I'm going to, I, I would like him to just for two or three minutes tell us about um, um, liability, what liability you have as an organization when it comes to these data breaches, just to give us like an insight of how responsible you are and what fines can come to you or what risk exposures you have when data breaches happen and it's your fault. Professor Ajogu, please just for two minutes before we round off, sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm not uh, a data expert, but um, I have learned a lot and um, soaked in quite a lot of knowledge. But uh, what I can say is that there are real issues both in law and uh, in fact about uh, data security. And considering that we've all migrated to the platform where we now work from home, as you can see, I am working from home, multitasking, learning, and uh, soaking up vitamin D, which we're told is part of the uh, immuno defense system that we need to do in the new times. But more importantly, I would just like to say that we pay attention to this. More than ever, the ether to secure data of staff uh, of, of organizations have now been left fragmented with all staff, 
everybody working from their different location in tablets, on their phones. So more than ever, data security has become highlighted. So I think we should pay attention. That we're carrying these things with ourselves and at home is no defense to lawsuits which will come if there's data breach or more, even more seriously in the, in the financial services sector if it results to in losses because there's been fraud and people who are bored at home will work on penetrating anything they can. So I think we should listen to our very distinguished panelists. They've spoken now, taking copious notes and I think that there's a whole lot that we need to do. And I thank the organizers, the Society for Corporate Governance, um, for bringing this uh, material knowledge to us at this present time. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, sir. All the best. Thank you very much, sir. Mrs. Ilda Inko, the Chief Executive Officer of the Society, is just going to take closing remarks and round up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Okay, Adita, you started with my first line. You ended with my first line. So thank you everybody for joining us today for this session. I'd like to first of all thank all our panelists, Professor David West, um, Adesheye, and Walter. You have done noble and we really appreciate the knowledge you've brought to the fore. Unfortunately, we are not able to cover everything that this topic entails. And so we'll advise that you please watch this space. We're going to have smaller classrooms where we will deal with issues that have been raised here in more details. So we'll ask that you please keep abreast, uh, just watch the space for information about that, about further trainings on this subject matter. The Society for Corporate Governance in Nigeria continues to welcome membership, you know, across sectors, if you're in Nigeria, Keda and above, please um, hit us in the chat room with your questions and you know, indicate your interest to join as a member of the society. We'll continue to run relevant webinars. We are going to be running the second part of the webinar on regulatory, the understanding dynamics of regulatory compliance. And this time we'll be talking to all the regulators you know, that we're not able to take on the last time we had this program. So I want to thank you very much and we look forward to having you at our subsequent programs. Thank you, Prof, for your input, Professor Ajogu SAN, and we look forward to having you as well at our subsequent uh, webinars. Thank you very much and God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.